Thank you. Thank you, Max. And um, you realize, Skip, I'm a boy from Philadelphia, so we have a conflict tonight. <laughs> I can still name the entire uh, 76ers team from 1967 that beat the Celtics for the championship. <laughs> Your memory doesn't go back that far. I'm significantly older, actually. I will try and be brief and succinct tonight in celebrating Library of America. Library of America, among countless other things it has done, brings together two of my peculiar citizenships. One is um, a citizenship in the New Yorker magazine, where I have worked and written for the past 40 years, and the other is adopted citizenship in the country of France and in the world of Paris. And those two things may seem somewhat uh, far removed, but as is worth remembering at any time when we celebrate Library of America, Library of America began as a dream in the head and mind of, of one of my greatest predecessors, Edmund Wilson. And it began as a dream in the mind and imagination of Edmund Wilson exactly because Edmund Wilson was simultaneously a great patriot, a great patriot of American letters and a great cosmopolitan deeply in love with France. And he had realized that in France, the Pléiades series, which had begun then and continues on to this day, had done something that had never been done for American literature. And that was to create a series of uniform volumes, uh, uniformly edited, uniformly um, issued, that would get all of French literature in an easily available form, all that was essential of French literature, I should say, in an easily and readily available and uniform edition. And Wilson wrote at length and often about the need for the same thing to happen in America. So it was exactly his cosmopolitan knowledge of what was, what was possible and necessary in French literature that fed his powerful sense of American patriotism. Because what we tend to forget too easily is the degree to which Wilson's generation had to make the fight for American literature as a primary literature, not as a secondary or derivative literature, but as a literature that could stand on its own alongside English literature or French literature or the literature of any other language. We take that for granted now, but we forget the act of moral heroism that was required for Wilson's generation, Wilson himself, but forgotten figures like Van Wyck Brooks as well, to put the case that not only was the American literature of the 20th century, the literature of Hemingway and Faulkner, and um, which had obviously come to dominate center stage, but the literature that preceded it, the writing of Twain, uh, the writing of Dickinson, and above all, the writing of Herman Melville, which had utterly changed the world. I found out only very recently, in terms of making these uh, constellation-like connections that the great French filmmaker, Jean-Pierre Melville, had never had named nothing like Melville, but had taken Melville's name at the height of the occupation as a sign of his commitment to, Melville, to our Melville's existential vision. That was the brew in which the vision of Library America, that was the primordial soup uh, in which the vision of American literature that Library of America exemplifies began, exactly in the mixture of an inspiration from France and an enormously patriotic impulse of a powerful and uh, salubrious kind uh, here. It informs the work of the Library of America, I believe, right to the present moment. Let me just speak quickly about those two volumes, three volumes actually, that um, Max mentioned that I've been engaged in the past couple of years. They are, by the original standards of uh, Wilson's vision, uh, somewhat eccentric. One was the collected works of S.J. Perlman, uh, certainly a humorist and a satirist of the first rank who Wilson keenly admired. Wilson once said of Perlman, Sid is the only writer at the New Yorker who somehow escapes the dead hand of the copy editor, and I don't know how he does it. <laughs> Words which I have emblazoned above my desk in my perpetual struggles to do the same. But Perlman was not the kind of writer who Wilson and his coevals had in mind necessarily when they began it. They were thinking of Melville and Twain. They weren't thinking of Perlman. And yet Perlman's work as a satirist fits and slots perfectly into the ever-expanding sense of what the canon is 
that the Library of America is devoted to exploring. And then the other two volumes that with the brilliant help of John Kulka and the entire staff, the editorial staff of Library of America, which is of inestimable value to any uh, harried and overworked uh, author with a tendency to misspellings and misdatings, and I bless their assistance. The other volume was two volumes of a 17th century playwright working in an absolutist court, uh, Moliere, as translated by a major American poet in the 1940s and 1950s, Richard Wilbur. Once again, that was a volume that I think would have fallen even outside of Wilson's purview and his sense of what a library of America ought to do. But what Perlman and Wilbur have in common is that they are both great readers. And Perlman's work, as I tried to explain in the introduction I wrote for our anthology, is above all a record of reading, the record of a Jewish kid growing up in Providence, Rhode Island, who read everything, French, English, Italian, and created an entire fantasy world for himself out of everything he had read, which he then offered to us in revised and constantly amended and beautifully baroque and distended form throughout his life. Wilbur was a GI who came upon European culture at the moment of its absolute crisis when it seemed to be breaking apart at the end of the Second World War. And like so many of that heroic GI generation of writers, decided that he had to preserve and literally translate some part of it to bring to America at a moment of our cultural ascension. So he went about the task of translating Moliere into rhyme, which believe it or not, had never previously been attempted by any English-speaking translator. Moliere is written in rhyme, of course, but no one had seen the necessity of it. It was a genuinely heroic act, and its purpose, as I explained in an essay in The New Yorker not long ago, and I think I was invited onto the board of um, Library of America exactly to encourage my endless production of essays about writers whom the Library of America has decided <laughs> to canonize. As I tried to explain, Wilbur's infatuation with rhyme and his desire to make Moliere's particular kind of comedy of manners newly accessible to American audiences in the 40s and 50s was not in any sense an academic exercise, but it helped create and seed the great renaissance of rhyming verse, which continues to delight us in everything from the work of Phyllis McGinley to the great masterpieces of our much missed Stephen Sondheim. Both Perlman and Wilbur are readers who become writers. And for those of us who are readers who are writers, they are enormously cheering. But they also persist and exist for us of examples of how the cosmopolitan spirit feeds genuine American patriotism, of how a love and a relish for cultures and languages outside our own feeds and enriches our love for everything that is indigenous and native to these shores and to our language. We live in a moment of unending crisis in which a new form of nationalism threatens all of the humane and liberal values that we inherit from Wilson, from Wilbur, from Perlman, and from the entirety of Library of America. The antidote for that kind of nationalism is not indifference to the nation. It is exactly the kind of patriotism that is always and necessarily transitive with cosmopolitanism. There's nothing in my life that makes me prouder than being involved with the Library of America. Thanks so much.